Hi. Um, back again. Just uploaded the first video. Hopefully you guys uh, enjoyed it. So, yeah, chapter one of the stand because I don't want to do what I did to you guys 10 months ago and just forget about this channel entirely. So, without further ado, that's a pen, by the way. So, habitual pen chewer. Um, let's get going. Captain Trips, book one. Hapscomb, Hapscomb's Texaco sat on number 93 just north of Arnett, a pissant four street burg about 110 miles from Houston. Tonight the regulars were there, sitting by the gas register, drinking beer, talking idly while watching the bug, bugs fly into the big lighted sign. It was Bill Hapscomb's station, so the others deferred to him even though he was a pure fool. They would have expected the same deferral if they had been gathered gathered together in one of their business establishments, except they had none. In Arnett, it was hard times. In 1980, the town had two industries, a factory that made paper products for picnics and barbecues mostly, and a plant that made electronic calculators. Now the paper factory was shut down and the calculator plant was ailing. They could make them a lot cheaper in Taiwan, it turned out, just like those portable TVs and transistor radios. Norman Brewitt and Tommy Wanamaker, who had both worked in the paper factory, were on relief having run out of unemployment some, some time ago. Henry Carmichael and Stu Redman both worked at the calculator plant, but rarely got more than 30 hours a week. Victor Palfrey was retired and still smoked stinking home-rolled cigarettes, which were all he could afford. Now what I say is this, Hap told them, putting his hands on his knees and leaning forward. They just gotta say, screw this inflation shit. Screw this national debt shit. We got the presses and we got the paper. We're gonna run off 50 million thousand dollar bills and help them write the Christ in the circulation. Palfrey, who had been a machinist until 1984, was the only one present with sufficient self-respect enough to point out Hap's most obvious damn fool statements. Now, rolling another one of his shitty smelling cigarettes, he said, that won't get us nowhere. If they do that, it'll just be like Richmond in the last two years of the state's war. In those days, when you wanted a piece of gingerbread, you gave the baker a confederate dollar, he put, on the, he put it on the gingerbread, and cut out a piece just that size. He'd put on... Money's just paper, you know. I know some people don't agree with you, Hab said sourly. He picked up a greasy red plastic paper holder from his desk. I owe these people, and they're starting to get pretty itchy about it. Stu Redman, who was perhaps the quietest man in Arnett, was sitting in one of the cracked plastic wool coat chairs, a can of paps in his hand, looking out the big service station window at no number 93. Stu had known about poor. He had grown up that way right here in town, the son of a dentist who had died when Stu was seven, leaving his wife and two other children besides Stu. His mother had gotten work at the Red Ball truck stop just outside of Arnett. Stu could have seen it from where he sat right now if it hadn't burned down in 79. It had been enough to keep the four of them eating, but that was all. At the age of nine, Stu had gone to work, first for Rog Trucker, who owned the Red Ball, helping to unload trucks after school for 35 cents an hour, and then at the stockyards in the neighboring town of Braintree, lying, lying about his age to get 20 breaking back back-breaking hours of labor were a week at the minimum wage. Now, listening to Hap and Vic Palfrey agree up, argue about money and the mysterious way it had of drying up, he thought of the way his hands had bled at first from the pull, pulling the endless hard trucks of hides and guts. He had tried to keep that from his mother, but she had seen less than a week after he started. She wept over them a little, and she hadn't been a woman who wept easily. But she hadn't asked him to quit, quit the job. She knew what the situation was. She was a realist. Some of the silence in him came from the fact that he had never had friends or the time for him. There was school and there was work. His youngest brother, Dev, had died of pneumonia the year he began at the yards, and Stu had never gotten quite, quite gotten over that. Guilt, he supposed. He loved the Dev the best, but his passing also meant that there was one less mouth to feed. In high school, he had found football, and that was something his mother encouraged him, even though it cut into his work hours. You play, he said. If you get a ticket out of here, it's football, Stuart. You play. Remember Eddie Warfield. Eddie Warfield was a local hero. He had come from a family even poorer than Stu's own, had covered himself with glory as a quarterback of the regional high school team, had gone on to Texas A&M with that athletic scholarship, and had played for 10 years with the Green Bay Packers, mostly as a second-string quarterback, but on several memorable occasions as the starter. Eddie now owned a string of fast food restaurants across the West and Southwest, and in Arnett, he was an enduring figure of myth. In Arnett, when you said success, you meant Eddie Warfield. Stu was no QB and he was no Eddie Warfield, but it did seem to him as he began his junior year in high school that there was at least a fighting chance for him to get a small athletic scholarship. And then there were work-study programs, and the school's guidance counselor had told him about the NDAA loan program. Then his mom had gotten sick, 
had become unable to work. It was cancer. Two months before he graduated from high school, she had died, leaving Stu with his brother Bryce to support. Stu had turned down the athletic scholarship and had gone to work in the calculator factory. And finally, it was Bryce, three years Stu senior, who had made it out. He was now in Minnesota, system of St. Louis for IBM. He didn't write office often, and the last time he had seen Bryce was at the funeral after Stu's wife had died, died of exactly the same sort of cancer that killed his mother. He thought that Bryce might have have had his own guilt to carry, and that Bryce might be a little ashamed of his fact that his brother had turned into just another good old boy in a dying Texas town, spending his days doing time with the calculator plant and his nights either down at Habs or over at the Indian Head drinking Lone Star beer. The marriage had been the best time, and it had only lasted 18 months. The womb of his young wife had borne a single dark and malignant child. That had been four years ago. Since, he had thought of leaving Arnett, searching for something better, but small town inertia had held him. The low siren songs of familiar places and familiar faces. He was well liked in Arnett, and Vic Prolfrey had once paid him the ultimate compliment of calling him old time tough. As Vic and Hap chewed it out, there was still a little dust left in the sky, but the land was in shadow. Cars didn't go by on 93 much now, which was one reason that Hap had so many unpaid bills. But there was a car coming now, Stu saw. It was still a quarter of a mile distant, the day's last light putting a dusty shine on what was very on what very little chrome was left to it. Stu's eyes were sharp, and he made it to be a very old Chevrolet, maybe a 75. A Chevy, no lights on, doing no more than 15 miles an hour weaving all over the road. No one had seen it yet but him. Now let's say you get a mortgage payment on this station, Vic was saying. Let's say it's $50 a month. It's a hell of a lot more than that. Well, for the sake of the argument, let's say 50 now let's just say the feds went ahead and printed you a whole carload of money. Well, then those bank people would turn around and want 150. You'd be just as poorly off. That's right, Carmichael added. Hap looked at him irritated. He happened to know that Hank had gotten into the habit of taking cokes out of the machine without paying the deposit. And furthermore, Hank knew he knew, and if Hank wanted to come in on any side, it ought to be his. It ain't necessarily how it would be, Hap said weightily from the depths of his ninth grade education. He went on to explain why. Stu, who only understood that they were in a hell of a pinch, turned Hap's voice down, the, down to a meaningless drone and watched the Chevy pitch and yaw its way up the road. The way it was going, Stu didn't think it was going to make it much farther. It crossed the white line and its left-hand tire spewed up dust from the left shoulder. Now it lurched back, held its own lane briefly, and then nearly pitched off into the ditch. Then, as if the driver had picked up the big lighted Texaco station sign up as a beacon, it arrowed toward the tarmac like a projectile whose velocity is near, very nearly spent. Stu could hear the worn-out thump of its engine now, the steady gurgle and wheeze of a dying carb and a loose set of valves. It missed the lower entrance and bumped up over the curb. The fluorescent bars over the pumps were reflecting off the Chevy's dirt streak windshield, so it was hard to see what was inside, but Stu, Stu saw the vague shape of the driver rule loosely with the bump. The car showed no sign of slowing from its relentless 15. So I say with more money in circulation, you'd be better turn off your pumps, Hap, Stu said mildly. The pumps, what? Norm Brewitt had turned to look out the window. Christ on a pony, he said. Stu got out of his chair, leaned over to Tommy Wanamaker and Hank Car Henry Carmichael, and flicked off all eight switches at once, four with each hand. So he was the only one who didn't see the Chevy as it hit the gas pumps on the lower upper island, on the upper island and sheared them off. It plowed into him with a slowness that seemed implacable and somehow grand. Tommy Wanamaker swore in the Indian head the next day that the taillights never even flashed once. The Chevy just kept coming at a steady, steady 15 or so, like the pace car on the Tournament of Roses Parade. The undercarriage screeched over the concrete island, and when the wheels hit it, everyone but Stu saw the driver's head swing limply and strike the windshield, starred, starring the glass. The Chevy jumped like an old dog that had been kicked and plowed away the high test pump. It snapped off and rolled away, spilling a few dribbles of gas. The, came, the nozzle came unhooked and lay glittering under the fluorescence. They all saw the sparks produced by the Chevy's exhaust pipe grating across the cement, and Hap, who had seen a gas station explosion in Mexico, instinctively shielded his eyes against the fireball he expected. Instead, the Chevy's rear, rear end floated around and fell off the pump island on the station side. The front end smashed into the low lead pump, lock, knocking it off with a hollow bang. Almost deliberately, the Chevrolet finished its 360 degree turn, hitting the island again broadside this time. The rear end popped up on the island and knocked the regular gas pump a sprawl. And there, the Chevy came to rest, trailing its rusty exhaust pipe behind it. It had destroyed all three of the gas pumps on the island nearest the highway. The motor continued to run choppily for a few seconds and then quit. The silence was so loud, it was alarming. Holy moly, Tommy Wanamaker said breathlessly. Will she blow, Hap? If it was gonna, it already would have, Hap said, getting up. 
His shoulder bummed the mat case, scattering Texas, New Mexico, and Arizona every which way. Hap felt a cautious sort. Hap felt a cautious sort of jubilation. His pumps were insured, and the insurance was paid up. Mary had harped on the, sh- the insurance ahead of everything. Guy must have been pretty drunk, Norm said. I seen his tail lights. Tommy said, his voice high with his, his voice high with excitement. They never flash once. Holy moly! If he had been doing sixty, we'd all be dead now. He really likes that holy moly. Um. They hurried out of the office. Hap first, and Stu bringing up the rear. Hap, Tommy, and Norm reached the car together. They could smell gas and hear the low clock-like tick of the Chevy's cooling engine. Hap opened the driver's side door, and the man behind the wheel spilled out like an old laundry sack. God damn! Norm Bruitt shouted, almost screamed. He turned away, clutched his ample belly, and was sick. It wasn't the man who had fallen out. Hap caught, had caught him nearly before he could thump to the pavement, but the, the smell was, that was issuing from the car. A sick stench compounded of blood, fecal matter, vomit, and human decay. It was a ghastly, rich, sick, dead smell. A moment later, Hap turned away, dragging the driver by the armpits. Tom hastily grabbed the dragging feet, and he and Hap carried him into the office. In the glow of the overhead fluorescence, their faces were cheesy and look, looking and revolted. Hap had forgotten about his insurance money. The others looked into the car, and then Hank turned away, one hand over his mouth, little finger sticking off like a man who has just raised his wine glass to make a toast. He tried to the north end of the station's lot and let his supper come up. Vic and Stu looked into the car for some time, looking at each other, and then looked back in. On the passenger side was a young woman, her shift dress hiked up high on her thighs. Leaning against her was a boy or a girl about three years old. They were both dead. Their necks had swelled up like inner tubes, and the flesh was up there was a purple-black color like a bruise. The flesh was pumped up under their eyes, too. They looked, Vic later said, like those baseball players who put lamp black under their eyes to cut the glare. Their eyes bl- bulged sightlessly. The woman was holding the child's hand. Thick mucus had run from their noses and was now clotted there. Flies buzzed around them, lighting, it, lighting in the mucus, crawling in and out of their open mouths. Stu had been in the war, but he had never seen so some, seen anything so terribly pitiful as this. His eyes were kindly, constantly drawn back to those linked hands. His eyes were constantly... Oh, I already said that. He and Vic backed away, backed away together and looked blankly at each other. Then they turned to the station. They could see Hat drawing frantically into the payphone. Norm was walking towards the station behind them, throwing glances at the wreck over his shoulder. The Chevy's driver's side door stood sadly open. There was a pair of baby shoes hang- dangling from the rearview mirror. Hank was standing by the door, rubbing his mouth with a dirty handkerchief. Jesus, Stu, he said unhappily, and Stu nodded. Hap hung up the phone. The Chevy driver was laying on the floor. Ambulance will be here in ten minutes. Do you figure there? He jerked his thumb at the Chevy. They're dead, okay, Vic nodded. His line face was yellow pale, and he was sprinkling tobacco all over the floor as he tried to make one of his shitty smelling cigarettes. They're the two deadest people I've ever seen. He looked at Stu, and Stu nodded, putting his hands in his pockets. He had the butterflies. The man on the floor moaned thickly in his throat, and they all looked down at him. After a moment, when it became obvious that the man was speaking or trying very hard to speak, Hap knelt beside him. It was, after all, his station. Whatever had been wrong with the woman and the child in the car was also wrong with this man. His nose was running freely, and his respiration had a peculiar undersea sound, a churning from somewhere in his chest. The flesh beneath his eyes was puffing, not black yet, but a bruised purple. His neck looked too thick, and the flesh had pushed up a column to give him two extra chins. He was running a high fever. Being close to him was like squatting on the edge of an open barbecue kit where gold coals had been laid. The dog, he muttered. Did you put him out? Mr. Hap said, shaking him gently. I called the ambulance. You're going to be all right. Clock went red, the man Clock went red. The man on the floor grunted and then began to cough, racking chain-like explosions that sent heavy mucus spraying from his mouth in long and ropey splatters. Hap leaned backwards, grimacing desperately. Better roll him over, Vic said. He's going to choke on it. But before they could, the coughing tapered off into bellowed, uneven breathing again. His eyes blinked slowly and he looked at the men gathered above him. Where's this? Arnett? Hap said. Bill Hapscombe's Texaco. You crashed on some of my pumps. And then, hastily, he added, that's okay, they was insured. The man on the floor tried to sit up and was unable. He had to settle for putting a hand on Hap's arm. My wife. My little girl. They, they're fine, Hap said, grinning a foolish dog grin. Seems like I'm awful sick, the man said. Breath came in and out of him in a thick, soft roar. They were sick, too, since we got up two days ago. Salt Lake City. His eyes flickered slowly closed. Sick. Guess we didn't move quick enough, after all. Far off, but getting closer, they could hear the whoop of the Arnett Volunteer Ambulance. 
Man, Tommy Wanamaker said. Oh, man. The sick man's eyes fluttered open once again, and now they were filled with an intense, sharp concern. He struggled again to sit up. Sweat ran down his face. He grabbed Hap. Are Sally and baby Levon all right, he demanded. Spittle flew from his lips, and Hap could feel the man's burning heat radiating outward. The man was sick, half crazy. He stank. Hap was reminded of the smell an old dog blanket gets sometimes. They're all right, he insisted a little frantically. You just lay down and take it easy, okay? The man lay back down. His breathing was rougher now. Hap and Hank helped him roll over on his side, and his respiration seemed to ease a trifle. I felt pretty good until last night, he said, coughing, but all right. Woke up with it in the night. Didn't get away quick enough. Is baby Levon okay? The last trailed off into something none of them could make out. The ambulance siren warbled closer and closer. Stu went over to the window to watch for it. The other remained in a circle around the man on the floor. What's he got, Vic? Any idea? Hap asked. Vic shook his head. Don't know. Might have been something they ate, Newham Brewitt said. That car's got a California plate. They was probably eating a lot at a lot of roadside stands, you know. Maybe they got a poison hamburger. It happens. The ambulance pulled in and skirted the wrecked Chevy to stop between it and the station door. The red light on top made crazy, crazy sweeping circles. It was full dark now. Give me your hand and I'll pull you up out of there, the man on the floor cried suddenly and then was silent. Food poisoning. Yeah, that could be. I hope so. Because what, Hank asked? Because otherwise it might be something, something catching. Vic looked at them with troubled eyes. I seen cholera back down in 58, down near no gals, and it looked something like this. Three men came in, wheeling a stretcher. Hap, one of them said, you're lucky you didn't get your scraggy ass blown to kingdom come. This guy, huh? They broke apart to let them through. Billy Wrecker, Monty Sullivan, Carlos Ortega, men they all knew. There's two folks in that car, Hap said, drawing Monty aside. Women and a little girl, both dead. Holy crow, you sure? Yeah, this guy, he don't know. You gonna take him to Braintree? I guess. Monty looked at him bewildered. What do I do with the two in the car? I don't know how to handle this, Hap. Stu can call the state patrol. You mind if I ride in with you? Hell no. They got they got the man under the stretcher, and while they ran him out, Hap went over to the stew. I'm gonna ride into Braintree with that guy. Would you call the state patrol? Sure. And Mary, too. Call and tell her what happened. Okay. Hap, trot, Hap trotted out to the ambulance and climbed on in. Billy Vecker shut the doors behind him and they called the other two. They had been staring at the wrecked Chevy with dead fascination. A few moments later, the ambulance pulled out, siren warbling, the red dome light pulsing blood shadows across the gas station's tarmac. Stu went on the phone and put a quarter in. The man from the Chevy died 20 miles from the hospital. He drew one fin final bubbling gasp, let it out, hitched in a smaller one, and just quit. Hap got the man's wallet out of his hip pocket and looked at it. There was $17 in cash. California driver's license identified him as Charles D. Campion. There was an army card and pictures of his wife and daughter encased in plastic. Hap didn't want to look at the pictures. He stuffed the wallet back into the dead man's pocket and told Carlos to turn off the siren. It was 10 after 9. So, that was it. So, basically, the guy from the preface, Charles, Charlie, um, escaped off the space with some terrible disease. And, um... Made it to here, and we got to meet one of our main characters, Stu Redman, and some of his buddies. So, yeah, hope you enjoyed. Thanks.